Welcome everyone to Mayo Clinic q and I'm Dr. Helena Gazelka. Cardiac amyloidosis occurs when a protein byproduct called amyloid builds up in the heart muscle. This inhibits the heart's ability to pump blood and is sometimes referred to as stiff heart syndrome. While there is no cure, there are treatment options available to manage the symptoms, treat underlying conditions, and slow the progression of the disease. At the Mayo Clinic in Florida, a new multidisciplinary cardiac amyloidosis clinic is being launched to bring together multiple specialties to care for patients with amyloid. Joining to us to discuss this today is Mayo Clinic cardiologist, Dr. Melissa Lyle. Thanks for being here today, Dr. Lyle. Well, thank you so much for having me. Well, I always like to say that I like to learn something every day when we do these, and I'm certainly expecting to learn something about amyloid today. So thank you so much for being here. Oh, of course, of course. First, would you explain for our listeners in, in terms that we can understand, what is cardiac amyloidosis? Sure. Well, just like you mentioned, Dr. Gazelka, amyloid, it's really an umbrella term. It just describes the misfolding of proteins. And when those misfolded proteins then aggregate together, they actually form long amyloid fibrils. And then those can deposit in soft tissue, nerves, or, or organs. And in the case of cardiac amyloidosis, they deposit in the heart muscle itself. And so cardiac amyloidosis actually results in a type of heart failure that we call a restrictive cardiomyopathy that basically just means the heart is thicker and stiffer than a normal heart. I understand that there are two main types of uh, amyloidosis. Could you explain the difference between the two? Yes, so there are a variety of different proteins that actually can misfold and form those amyloid fibrils that then infiltrate the myocardium or heart muscle. However, the two most common are immunoglobulins, which are things that fight infection, and it's specifically the light chain component of the immunoglobulin, as well as a protein called transthyretin. So in AL amyloidosis, it's actually a problem with the bone marrow. So the plasma cells in the bone marrow start to overproduce these immunoglobulin light chains. And then they end up becoming misfolded and form the amyloid fibrils that affect the heart. And in ATTR amyloidosis, the liver actually produces a protein called transthyretin. And this is a carrier protein. So it transports thyroxin and retinol, which is just vitamin A. And it's a four-sided protein. When it becomes unstable, it can actually break apart and form smaller proteins. Those smaller proteins are the ones that can misfold and form amyloid fibrils that again can infiltrate and weave their way into the heart muscle. That's fascinating. So the disease either comes from one's bone marrow in their bones or from their liver. Exactly. Dr. Lyle, you've been referring to light chains. Can you explain to us what is a light chain and uh, what does it mean? Yes. So the bone marrow, those cells in the bone marrow that produce the immunoglobulin, that is a protein that fights infection. The immunoglobulin is actually made up of two components, both a heavy and a light chain. So the light chain is a component of the immunoglobulin, and that's actually what gets overproduced in the setting of AL amyloidosis. But would you normally have the immunoglobulin and it just it is overproduced or it's made wrong or? So normally you would have the, am, the immunoglobulin and you would have your light chains, both kappa and lambda. However, in the setting of AL amyloidosis, there's just way too many light chains. So with the overproduction of those light chains, then they're more likely to misfold and form those amyloid fibrils. Do we have any idea what causes someone to develop amyloid? So in the case of AL amyloid, it really is the problem with the bone marrow. For some reason, those plasma cells go haywire and start overproducing the light chains. In the case of ATTR amyloidosis, there's actually two types. 
The hereditary form called hereditary ATTR amyloidosis is related actually to an inherited mutation. And that genetic mutation makes that protein unstable, more likely to break apart and then be able to form the amyloid fibrils. And the other type of ATTR amyloidosis, wild type ATTR amyloid, there's no inherited or genetic mutation. For some reason, we don't really know why, the protein just becomes unstable and then forms those amyloid fibrils. I'm going to imagine that a lot of our listeners have never heard of amyloidosis. How common is cardiac amyloidosis? Yes, that's a great question. So AL cardiac amyloidosis and really AL amyloidosis in general is actually relatively rare. However, ATTR amyloidosis is really not that rare. It was just previously underdiagnosed. And now because of greater awareness and also increasing education about ATTR amyloidosis, we have recognized that it's actually a fairly common cause of heart failure in our patients, particularly our older population. And it's a very common cause of heart failure with someone who still has a normal pumping function of their heart. You explain that um, sometimes this is hereditary and sometimes it's not. Who would be at particular risk of developing the disease? Yes, so with AL amyloidosis, it seems as if men and women are equally affected and the average age of diagnosis is after about the age of 50. Now in wild type ATTR amyloidosis, which typically manifests as cardiac amyloidosis, there seems to be a predilection for the older population, particularly males. And the average age of diagnosis is after the age of 75. Now for hereditary ATTR amyloidosis, we actually see this present in a younger patient population. It's interesting because the specific mutation that we see, the valine 122 isoleucine mutation, that's actually the most common genetic mutation in the United States for TTR amyloid, is present in about three to 4% of the African American population. So, how would someone know if they were at risk? Are there certain signs or symptoms uh, that would develop? Yes, so cardiac amyloidosis typically will present as a form of heart failure. And so the signs and symptoms are those that are similar seen, similarly seen with heart failure. So patients can often come in with shortness of breath when they exert themselves or shortness of breath at rest. And then also they can have lower leg swelling, abdominal swelling, and then even generalized fatigue. Those are all symptoms that we would look out for as possible, possibly related to cardiac amyloidosis. Abnormal heart rhythms can also be seen, so such as atrial fibrillation, that can be associated with cardiac amyloidosis as well. It's interesting. It sounds like there is a lot of overlap between those symptoms and uh, symptoms that you can see in many other illnesses or disorders. Exactly right. So it often can be sort of vague presentations, but that's why it's important to bring those symptoms up to your physician as soon as possible so that we can look for other red flags. Sometimes amyloidosis is associated with other findings like bilateral carpal tunnel syndrome or lumbar stenosis. So then your physician can help tease out if you may be at risk for amyloidosis. Well, that's very interesting. How does the physician diagnose if a patient might have amyloidosis? So typically we would look first at an echocardiogram or an ultrasound of, our, of your heart, and that will give us an idea if there is a suspicion of cardiac amyloidosis. Occasionally we, we will use cardiac MRI to help get the pictures of the heart that are necessary. And then we work to focus on a diagnosis of whether it's AL versus ATTR amyloidosis using a combination of blood work and imaging techniques. It's very interesting. Um, is there a way that this can be prevented, either the hereditary or the spontaneous form? 
Unfortunately, we don't have any preventative strategies for cardiac amyloidosis, but the key is really early detection. We want to make sure that we can detect these patients earlier so that we can get them on the right treatments. What are the right treatments if someone is diagnosed? Yes, so great question. So for AL amyloidosis, just as a reminder, it's that problem with the plasma cells in the bone marrow, and they start overproducing those light chains. So our hematologists really are going to gear their therapy towards controlling the plasma cells in the bone marrow. And then that's actually with chemotherapy. So we use chemotherapy to control the plasma cells, and in occasional situations, an autologous stem cell transplant might be needed as well. In the case of ATTR amyloidosis, however, there are a lot of new therapies now. So it's sort of an exciting time for cardiac amyloidosis related to TTR amyloid. One category of therapy, actually uh, the liver, it stops the liver from producing that transthyretin protein in general. And so by stopping the production of the transthyretin, it slows or halts the progression of the disease. Those medicines are referred to as the RNA silencers, and that's medications referred to as patisseran and inotersin. And they've actually are currently FDA approved for the treatment of hereditary ATTR polyneuropathy, so related to nerve problems. But there's clinical investigations looking at the involvement in the treatment options for cardiac amyloid. Another category of therapy actually are the stabilizers, and those keep that transthyretin protein from becoming unstable and breaking apart. And tofamidus is the medication that's FDA approved currently for both hereditary and wild type ATTR cardiac amyloidosis. It sounds very complex. <laughs> and I can see why you have a whole clinic to manage this. Yes. <laughs> Melissa, when I was an anesthesia resident um, Buku years ago, I remember doing transplants for patients who had amyloidosis, organ transplants. Yes. And is that just patients who have very advanced disease or, or do we do those anymore? That's a great question. So actually previously for the hereditary form of ATTR amyloidosis, we were doing liver transplantation. However, now with the advancements in therapy with the RNA silencers, we're trending away from needing a liver transplant and just being able to offer the medication for the hereditary ATTR amyloidosis. Now, unfortunately, we still see some of our patients that present uh, at a later time with end-stage heart failure. And at that time, they are still being evaluated and considered for heart transplantation. That is fascinating. What an amazing and important discovery that must have been when those medications came out because liver uh, livers are few and far between. And I can imagine patients' disease could advance while they were waiting for a liver. Yes, absolutely. So we are very thankful to have these new therapies and then clinical investigations continue. So hopefully we'll have even more advancements in the future. That's amazing. Melissa, can you tell us a little bit about the cardiac amyloidosis um, uh, multidisciplinary clinic? Yes, so we are working to build a multidisciplinary amyloid clinic here at Mayo Clinic Florida. And what we are doing is basically having a collaborative effort amongst several different specialties, including hematology, cardiology, transplant cardiology, as well as neurology and nephrology. And our goal is really to provide an efficient evaluation for our patients so that we can quickly come to the correct diagnosis and offer the best treatment option. And we're engaging all of our different specialties really for this comprehensive visit to provide the best overall care. You know, you mentioned something that was interesting to me and that was hematology and oncology. And I heard you say earlier that chemotherapeutic agents are used in management of some types of amyloid. Does that mean that this is a cancer um, or the the drugs use differently. 
So yes, we do consider AL amyloidosis a form of bone marrow cancer. We specifically call it a plasma cell dyscrasia because those plasma cells start overproducing the light chains. And the hematologists really steer the treatment options. As cardiologists, we help manage their signs and symptoms of heart failure, but the hematologists will make recommendations in regard to the specific chemotherapeutic regimen. There's been a lot of advancements in terms of the chemotherapy for amyloid as well. And then they will decide whether or not that autologous stem cell transplant is needed. That is really fascinating. Thank you for all that you shared with us today. Yes, Melissa. of course. Our thanks to Dr. Melissa Lyle, cardiologist at the Mayo Clinic in Florida, for coming today to speak with us about cardiac amyloidosis. I know that I learned something today, and I sure hope you did too. We wish everyone a wonderful day. Mayo Clinic Q&A is a production of the Mayo Clinic News Network and is available wherever you get and subscribe to your favorite podcasts. To see a list of all Mayo Clinic podcasts, visit newsnetwork.mayoclinic.org. Then click on podcasts. Thanks for listening and be well.